Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to this channel and this is the health and wellness spot. I am Dr. Lewis and today we are going to handle the digestive system, the functions, the anatomy, basically what is involved in the entire uh, system of digestion. Now, digestion basically is the system that takes in food, then digests the food and then absorbs it so that you get the nutrients that you require from that food. And again, excretes all the food or the particles that you don't need after an entire process of absorption and digestion of food. So welcome, and this is the digestive system. Now, onto the digestive system, we have two things that are involved. Number one, we have the alimentary canal. So this alimentary canal. Alimentary canal is basically a tube, a hollow tube that runs from the mouth all the way and snakes through up to the anus, okay? So that is the alimentary uh, uh, canal. Then the other part is the accessory organs. Now the accessory organs are all organs that are involved in digestion, but they are not part of the alimentary canal, okay? And therefore these organs join the alimentary canal through tubes or ducts, and they, 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 their input is through secretions of enzymes uh, that aid in digestion and breakdown of food particles. So, first of all, we'll start with the alimentary canal as we head towards the, uh, the accessory organs and then finally the functions of the uh, digestive system. So number one, we have the mouth. This, the entry of food into the alimentary canal is through a hollow tube that is called the mouth. So your mouth is the first part of the digestive system followed by the back of the neck, which is the pharynx, Okay. Then followed by the esophagus. Then at this moment on the stomach, above the stomach, we have a sphincter that is called the cardiac sphincter. Basically, this is to, to uh, reduce or to prevent the backflow of food from the stomach into the esophagus. Okay. And this is the sphincter that is affected mostly when people have peptic ulcer disease. We will get to know how. Again, below the stomach, there's another sphincter here that is called uh, uh, the pyloric sphincter, okay? And this function is also to aid food to go into the small intestines and not come back into the stomach. So this is the stomach. Good. Now, so we have this sphincter and we have this sphincter. Then this is the small intestines. Okay, and then the finally here we have the large intestines. And the anus. So the end of it all is the anus. But remember here we have a rectum. So basically those are the parts of uh, the alimentary canal. How about the accessory organs? So we'll get to understand all these uh, parts of the alimentary canal. Also remember that this alimentary canal is lined by muscles that aid in movement of food and that is called peristalsis. Again, it is uh, outside it. We have the blood vessels where when the food is absorbed in their smallest form possible, it goes into the bloodstream. Also, there is a system that is called the lymphatic system. Basically, the other system apart from the blood system. And this is composed of immune cells. So we have the blood vessels, then the lymphatic system. I'm mentioning that because I'll take you through something called protein allergies and you'll get to understand how this come to occur. So hold that thought. Now, onto the accessory organs. This we said these are the organs, other organs that are involved in digestion but are not part of the alimentary canal. So we start from the mouth again. We have the teeth and the tongue. So number one, we have the teeth, the tongue. Okay, then as we go deeper, here we will have an organ here called the pancreas. So this side there is a pancreas. And this other side we have the liver. So we have the liver somewhere here. Then below the liver we have something called the gallbladder. This is the one that houses bile acids that will help you absorb fat. So we have the gallbladder. 
Good. So basically those are the organs that are involved uh, uh, in this system. Now, what are, what are the functions of this system? Okay. Before uh, we go to uh, an example of a disease uh, that affects this system. So what are the functions of this uh, organ? Now remember, basically the number one function of this organ has to be ingestion. This ingestion or intake. So basically ingestion is just eating. Basically, that's simple as that. Eating, taking food through your mouth so that it can get access to every other organ in your mouth. Then number two, we have secretion. And what is secretion? Secretion is basically the production of juices and enzymes that will aid in breakdown of this food. For example, the pancreas will give you enzymes like lipase, uh, like uh, insulin, the ones that are involved in the process of digestion and control of blood sugar. So basically secretion is uh, through these glands that give you uh, and ducts that give you these enzymes and sometimes uh, even the acid, secretion of the acid in the stomach that will help in digestion of protein and all that. The liver also secretes other substances like pepsinogen and all these proteins that will aid in digestion. So that is function number two. Function number three, we have mixing. Now remember, as the food goes through, we have a process called peristalsis. Now this peristalsis is the movement of uh, the muscle contractions and relaxation as food goes, goes down into the stomach. Now this increases the friction, okay? So this increases the friction all over the gut and this can affect the cells that lie in the gut. So if that friction is not controlled, then you'll have problems with the movement of this food. And also you might expose yourself to things like esophagus, cancer and stuff. Therefore, how do you handle this uh, movement and this friction? Through production of mucus. And secretion is, uh, uh, mucus is secretion is part of the secretion role of the GIT. Now mixing is like in the stomach where it turns over food substances and uh, up and down so that uh, you can mix it well with the enzymes and these digestive juices for you to get an adequate result as at the end of uh, digestion. So number four all, we have digestion now. Under digestion, we have two. Digestion is divided into, one is mechanical, and the other one is chemical. So, mechanical digestion starts from the mouth where we have the teeth and the tongue trying to roll food and break it out, tear it into small pieces for you to uh, have a good uh, chance to absorb this food. Again, in the stomach, there is turnover, physical turnover and breakdown of this food into the smallest part possible. Also, we have the digestive scissors, okay? Those scissors that break down larger particles. And remember, food has to be absorbed in its limited or its smallest uh, form, which is carbohydrates are absorbed in as, as glucose, so they have to be broken down from the mouth as we go down through uh, salivary amylase. Also, remember, as part of uh, the accessory organs, we also have something called the salivary glands. I had forgotten that. So take note of that. So salivary glands give you salivary amylase, which is an enzyme that breaks down uh, carbohydrates. So as you go towards the stomach, you've broken down carbohydrates. Then in the stomach, you start breaking it down again. The, the, the food particles that are in protein in nature, alcohol is also broken down in the stomach and absorbed in the stomach through its smallest form. So carbohydrates will be absorbed through uh, as glucose. Protein will be broken down to amino acids and absorbed as amino acids. And lipids will also be broken down by lipase, which is produced by the pancreas in the small intestines, and then sequestered or made soluble using enzymes that come from the liver and the gallbladder and the, gall, uh, the, uh, the bile juice. So it will make it more soluble and cut it down into small pieces so that you can absorb the fat. So fat is absorbed in the small intestines and again uh, broken down in the small intestines. Things like proteins are broken down in there in the gut, in the stomach, and then absorbed in the small intestine. So small intestines is the larger part where absorption takes place, okay, for that matter. And then the, the, the large intestines, very minimal ab absorption for, like, for example, water, for example, other nutrients, and those food particles that did not get absorbed uh, through uh, the small intestines will be absorbed in uh, the large intestines. So basically that's what happens. Then that is now mechanical digestion. So we break it down physically, turnover in the stomach. But chemical digestion is the one that involves uh, enzymes, hydrochloric acid in the stomach. All these are chemical breakdowns. So once you break them down into their smallest form possible, 
then you can absorb them into the bloodstream for them to be supplied all over the body and to, to tissues. Then function number five has to be absorption. So it is the role of the gut or the, 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 the digestive system to absorb nutrients. Basically, after you break these nutrients down and you've uh, digested them both chemically and physically, you need to absorb them so that they get into the bloodstream and flow all over the body. So basically, that is what the absorption uh, uh, does or how absorption happens. And basically, the major part of food absorption has to be the small intestines. Remember, the small intestine is the one that has uh, this... Uh, finger-like projections that are called villi. So these villi are the ones that are, uh, improve the surface area or they increase the surface area for absorption and therefore food is absorbed through this. Okay. Then number six role of the digestive system then has to be excretion. Now remember vitamins are absorbed in the large intestine. So the remaining of the vitamin are absorbed in the large intestine. Now, we have excretion. Basically, excretion is just the take out of the food. The particles that are uh, uh, the uningested food particles that have been stored in the large intestine for quite some time. Now they've been turned over by bacteria. And remember, in the large intestine is where we have a large amount of bacteria. Okay? So these bacteria that help you break the food or the fiber that uh, has, is indigestible. And it's been stored here. The bacteria that are there have to be a high quantity so that they can break this and make stool for you to pass it out. Some of the remainder of this, uh, the remainder of these particles can be absorbed again, like water, vitamins, and others through the large intestines. Now, we've already said in the small intestine, in the large intestine is where we have bacteria. So a large population of gut bacteria are found in the large intestines. Okay, there is a limited number of bacteria in the small intestines. So, anytime uh, you start eating poor diets, you start messing up your system or such types of things, the bacteria in the large intestine start moving back into the small intestines. Okay? Once they move back into the small intestines, they will cause your condition that we call SIBO. SIBO is basically small intestine bacteria overgrowth. So, small intestine bacteria or small intestinal bacteria overgrowth so this means that you have the bacteria that normally do not grow in the small intestines have been pulled into the small intestine and they start giving you all this bloating you pass gas and these are uh, painful abdominal pains okay so that is what we call SIBO so therefore there's bacteria in the small intestines where these bacteria are not supposed to be bacteria are supposed to be in the large intestines now fermented cabbage which is called sauerkraut People who have this SIBOL are not supposed to consume fermented cabbage. Why? Because fermented cabbage also has bacteria that aids in digestion. And remember, bacteria is supposed to be in the large intestines. So you can imagine consuming fermented cabbage when you have SIBO. That means you'll only be adding bacteria to the small intestine. And that will worsen SIBO. So if I told you eat cabbage and then you have bloating, then understand it's high time you start fasting. Why? Once you fast, this bacteria will disappear from here because there's no food substances. So they'll go back to where they belong and then you clear your SIBO. But if you keep eating wheat products and you keep eating all the time, you're feeding this bacteria. Specifically, if you eat vegetables, which are fiber, you keep on feeding this bacteria and you'll experience those bloating all the time. Okay? Good. So that is SIBO. Now, excretion is basically taking them out. So that is the function of the digestive system. Basically, we've just tackled two forms uh, or two, two, two sides of this digestive system. The first side being the alimentary canal where we've mentioned the organs. Then the second one being the accessory organs. We've mentioned those accessory organs that aid in digestion and breakdown of food and absorption. Then after that, we've mentioned the function of the intestinal, uh, uh, the digestive system. Okay. Now, I want you to give you a case scenario in form of a disease. Number one, stomach acid is supposed to be highly acidic. There is hydrochloric acid here. So hydrochloric acid basically aids. The pH here has to be one to basically three. So that is a strong acid, which can melt even a spoon or steel or a blade. So if you ingest maybe steel, then this acid will burn it out. Okay. If you ingest food that has microorganisms that do not survive in acidic media, then it's the role of this HCl to break those bacteria down and kill them. It's also the role of HCl. So basically HCl provides the first immunity 
as you eat. When you eat, the first immunity that food will meet has to be the HCL. So it is supposed to be highly concentrated for you to have a, a, a well-functioning GIT. Remember also this HCL is the one that is uh, helpful in the breakdown of proteins to get amino acids. So the last function of that HCL is it tightens this sphincter. So if your stomach acid is highly concentrated, low pH, okay? So if it is highly concentrated at 1 to 3, then this sphincter will keep being tight. So there will, no, there will be no food moving from the stomach back into the esophagus. So you will not experience those heartburns, in quotes. However, if you drink alcohol, if you eat too much carbohydrates, these are foods that will neutralize this environment. If you take antacids, if you take uh, PPIs, omeprazoles and pantoprazoles, those drugs that affect stomach pH and the foods that affect the stomach pH, they will start raising this pH towards basic. And once you start raising this pH towards basic, that means you've altered the environment of the stomach. Remember, there are bacteria that survive under acidic pH. Okay? So they aid you in digestion. So once you start raising this pH towards basic, then these bacteria start to die. And what is the result? You will have again bloating, you'll have indigestion, you'll have uh, abdominal pains, and you will have an overgrowth of bad bacteria because good bacteria maintain the ratio between good and bad. So they compete for food and environment and, and, and food stuff, and therefore they suppress bad bacteria. So if you kill this good bacteria, then the bad bacteria come up. Then you'll have all these problems. Number two, there is a bacteria that is called H. pylori, the one that causes peptic ulcer disease. H. pylori cannot survive in this acidic environment. Okay, So H. pylori comes in, finds this acidic environment, and he has to adapt. By adapting means he will form a protein coat around himself. So as long as your stomach pH is highly acidic, H. pylori will never affect you because he is into hiding. Now, drugs that you use to treat H. pylori are antibiotics, and uh, uh, antacids, basically proton pump inhibitors or meprazole. Okay, so those antibiotics will kill bacteria that are helpful for you in the stomach. That is one problem. Number two, those antacids uh, that you use will neutralize the environment of the stomach and will head to basic. Once it heads to basic, remember H. pylori survives well in a basic environment. So what will he do? He will come out of this covering, the protein coat, and then start corroding your wall and multiplying. And that's where you go to the hospital and you take a H. pylori test, it turns positive. Not because H. pylori is harmful, but because you've released, you've messed up the stomach environment, and then H. pylori starts coming out of his hiding. So the best therapy for H. pylori is not to kill him, because you'll still get him through food. So the best regimen for H. pylori is to send him back into hiding. And how do you do that? Through fasting, because if you fast, you concentrate stomach acid. Once you concentrate stomach acid, H. pylori goes back into fasting, into, into hiding, sorry. So, therefore, it's a misconception to believe that ulcers require you to eat. Remember, if you have a wound here already, if you eat food, there is this movement called peristalsis. So, that food will rub against the wound and therefore, your symptoms of ulcers will worsen or your ulcers will keep worsening. Again, if you have, you've eaten food and it's basic, it is carbohydrates and sugar, then that means, and also seed oils, which are highly inflammatory to the gut. That means you'll send H. pylori from hiding to come out, multiply, and start affecting your gut, and that is an ulcer. So the best regimen for H. pylori is to eat healthy foods, which are keto diets, less of carbohydrates, so that you don't alter the environment of the acid, uh, of, the, of the stomach, and also start fasting. Now, remember, if this is strong enough, this sphincter will tighten, and therefore you'll not feel the heartburn. But if you mess this with alcohol and foods, you will loosen this sphincter. And therefore, food will go back into the esophagus, and that is what you call a heartburn. Good. Another thing, for instance, those people who always keep uh, telling us that I have protein allergy. Now, I want you to understand that protein allergy comes as a result of a messed up gut. And how do you mess up your gut? Eating seed oils, eating uh, wheat products. These seed oils and wheat products are highly inflammatory to your gut and your stomach. So what do they do? They perforate the stomach. So they make these holes into your stomach, these perforations. 
Now, once you make these perforations, remember we said on the lining of the stomach we have blood vessels and also we have the lymphatic system, which is basically the immune system, white blood cells. So once you perforate this and then you eat eggs, specifically the egg white, because the yolk cannot cause you protein allergies. Once you consume the egg white, particles of that egg white get through these perforations. Once they get through those perforations, what do they encounter? They encounter an immune system that recognizes them as foreign particles or foreign agents. And therefore the immune system is adapted to fighting foreign agents. Therefore it will start fighting this. And what will you get? You will get those skin eruptions that uh, you will think is a protein allergy. Now, if you stop eating these eggs you, and you keep eating the chapati and mandazi and stuff and those wheat products and the pasta and the cakes, you have not fixed this problem. So you have not done, you, and you keep also seed oils, you have not cleared these perforations, which means anytime you eat protein, they will perforate in. So the solution is not in stopping the egg eating. The solution is in, first of all, first to, to correct this, the inflammation, and also drop seed oils, drop wheat products, so that your stomach goes back to normal. These perforations seal. Once they seal, then you can enjoy your eggs. Okay, so those are the misconceptions, the misconceptions that uh, run around the digestive system and we wanted to correct them. We will keep talking about these things as we go ahead. Now that you've understood the digestive system, it will be easier for us to even talk about SIBO in details, to talk about peptic ulcer disease in details, to talk about uh, uh, inflammation, uh, inflammatory colitis or uh, uh, the inflammation of the colon and the cancers that affect these organs. And also uh, gallbladder problems like the gallstones the liver problems like the fatty liver and absorption of nutrients inside the stomach. So basically, that is uh, the digestive system.